Chapters five and six of Just Sweethearts, a Christmas Love Story by Harry Stillwell Edwards. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter five. The next note reached King four days after his meeting with Billy in the museum. The four days had seemed four years. It would be untrue to say that the mystery of it all did not continue to wear on him in the hours when he should have been sleeping, but the southerner is born and dies an optimist, and is usually loyal to his ideals. King's loyalty refused to entertain a doubt. Who could doubt Billy's eyes? The note came as his reward, or so he cheered himself. It appointed a meeting for the afternoon in one of New York's suburban churches. The choir will be rehearsing for Easter, but the church doors will be open, and only a few, if any, people in the pews. Go at four, and find a seat well back over on the left. I shall join you as soon as I am free to come. Dear King, I have been so miserable, so happy. Please, please, don't make love to me any more. But don't stop loving me. Please understand, I am not in a position for your love, now. Trust me, whatever happens, don't doubt that I love you. There now, I have said it. Does it make you happy? It makes me miserable, but I am only happy now when I'm miserable about you. Billy The world stood still for King Dubignon or at least time seemed to, when the hurried, unrevised, illogical little note revealed its message. Trust her? Trust Billy? Well, rather! He stowed it in his deepest pocket, along with some other priceless compositions of hers, and went off to church much ahead of the appointed time. The chiaroscuro over on the left received him, and ages after she glided into the pew and slipped her hand in his, while the choir sang afar off, Lead kindly light amid the encircling gloom. Speech, while the divine voices carried that wonderful song-prayer, would have been sacrilege, and though he did not analyze, it was expressing his feelings far better than he knew how. He covered the one hand he held with his other, and sat in silent bliss and presently she added the one little lonesome hand she had left to the friendly group and nestled up closer. "'Just sweethearts,' she whispered. When the hymn was ended, he was dreaming off toward a beautiful window of stained glass. The colors were exquisitely blended, the design simple. In the foreground was a cross and scroll bearing a name. In the deep perspective the sun was setting, its splendor on a single drifting cloud. To the right and left of the cross cherubs hovered, one face lifted, the other foreshortened, and eyes closed. The faces were identical. A loved one slept under the cross. A spirit had ascended to heaven. This was the story they told. You like my window? I call it mine because I love it so and I am afraid I come oftener to see it than to pray. Yes, said King gently, I like it. Have you seen it before? Yes. Tell me what about it impresses you most. The two little faces. Oh, I love them most, too. Perhaps you have never heard the romance, the miracle of that window? Romance? Miracle? It is a memorial to Agnes Vandilever, erected by her husband. Yes, I know, but the romance. The artist who designed it, though he had never seen or heard of her child, accidentally made the two faces portraits of that child. If she had posed for him, they could not have been nearer perfect. That's why her father selected the design over the dozen submitted. That I had heard. But the romance is this. The little girl is now grown, and one of the richest girls in the world. Are you listening? Yes, said King, whose gaze had returned to the two little faces. You are saying she is rich, one of the world's richest girls. I know that. A century, though, lies between her and the little ones yonder. She can never dream back to them. I was thinking of that. Wait! 
No man ever knows all that's in a girl's heart. Early in life, when she was just a little child, as pictured yonder, she was the victim of a ferry-boat collision off Cortland Street. My old lady friend, the one I live with, is her relative. I have seen Miss Vandilever many times, and have often read her story in some old newspapers. She was but eight years old when the accident occurred, and in the care of an old negro nurse on the boat. The family were on their way up from the south, and the little girl and her nurse had gone out of the cabin to the deck to see the lights. When the collision occurred, both were thrown into the river. In the confusion of the moment and noise of whistles and the screams, the minor accident was not noticed, nor were the cries of the woman and child heard except by one person, a boy of sixteen or seventeen, who was also out to see the lights, and probably New York for the first time. This boy plunged into the river from the sinking boat, and succeeded in reaching the little girl. Then, how, only the good God who was watching knows, he got out of his coat and kicked off his shoes, and would probably have swum to the wharves with her, but a tug at full speed and blowing its whistle for other boats to come ran over them. Shall I wait for the organ to stop? No, your voice and that music were made for just such a story. The tug ran over them? As it struck, the boy seized the dress of the child at the throat with his teeth, covered her face with his hands, and went down with her. The boat passed, and they rose and whirled in the foam of its wake. The boy's teeth held like a bulldog's, though the barnacles on the tug had torn his side cruelly, and something had broken his left arm. He could now only support the child by swimming on his back, her face drawn up under his breast, her hands clinging to his shoulders, and body floating free. He knew how to save a drowning person who wasn't panic-stricken. It must have been a brave child to keep her head through it all. As they drifted on with the tide, unseen, he comforted her, promising he would be sure to get her to the land and take her home. He stopped calling for help when he found his voice frightened her. And then he laughed to show her he was not afraid, and told her little stories of the South, where he came from, and sang the songs his black mammy sang to him when he was very little, so that the girl forgot her fears and put her faith in the wonderful boy who knew so much and had come to help her. Then, after a long while, he told her to try and sleep, to lay her head on his breast, but first to lift her face up toward the skies and pray God for her father and mother and the old black woman who had turned back because she couldn't swim and to bring the boy and herself to the land soon. And she did. And then, maybe, she went to sleep, for she could never afterwards remember any more. And maybe the boy went to sleep, too, for they found them both floating under the stars, off the Liberty Light hours later, his one good arm slowly, oh, so slowly, striking the water, the other broken and trailing under him, and his white face turned upward, and his teeth again clenched on the child's dress, so hard they had to cut it to get her away from him. Billy suddenly drew her hands away and covered her face. He was probably tired and asleep, too, said King gently. You can't drown that kind of chap. It's the song Absent that voice is singing up there, said Billy, furtively wiping her eyes. It always did get the best of me. Listen. My eyes grow dim with tenderness, the while thinking I see thee smile. You were telling me of the boy and girl, he reminded gently, as she sat dreaming. Yes, her father and mother, who had been saved, began a frantic search for her. She was their only child. They offered fortunes to anyone who would find her, dead or alive, and the river and bay were full of tugs and patrol-boats and fire-boats and launches hurrying here and there under the searchlights. When they found the poor old dead nurse with a little hair-ribbon clenched in her hand, all hope fled. But a barge-captain landed the boy and girl at the battery, 
In a few minutes the city knew that the little heiress to many millions was safe in her mother's arms. And great surgeons were working over the boy in St. Luke's. You must read it yourself some day. I lose so much in telling it. Go on, I'd rather hear you. But there isn't much more to tell. The boy refused to give his name. He seemed afraid somebody would hang a medal on him and make a speech, and that the papers would write him up and print his picture, and he'd never get over it. Said it was nothing, at last. That he could swim from Georgia to New York if the water stayed smooth and somebody was along to cook for him. But the girl and her mother came every day and brought him flowers and good things to eat, and in the imagination of that little child he grew to be the greatest hero in the world. And he must have liked her, for he would hold her hand and tell her the stories over and over. Br'er Rabbit and Br'er Fox and the Tar Baby. The old lady I live with has one of his little songs written out. It's Little Boy Blue, added to. Little Boy Blue and his master who found him asleep. Little boy blue, come blow your horn, the sheep's in the meadow, the cow's in the corn. Is that the way you mind my sheep, under the haystack, fast asleep? Master, the day was long and lonely, my mother looked down from the beautiful sky, and she sang me a song, one little song only, counting your sheep as they went by. Sleep, little lad, your watch I'll keep, some days are lonely, sad and long, and I'll give all my cows, and I'll give all my sheep, to hear once again my own mother's song. The boy in the hospital liked it, because he had no mother either, except to dream of. It was too beautiful to last. When he was almost well and his arm was out of the sling, the little girl's father came to talk business with him. Splendid plans for that boy, her father had, but they failed abruptly. He refused to consider them even. He refused everything except the cost of his coat and shoes, and the amount of money that was in the coat. He was an orphan, and on his way to school, he said, and was obliged to have that much. He was gentle and quiet about it all, and finally the girl's father said, "'You are an American, all right. I like your independence. Good for you.' And to the day of his death he loved and admired and talked about that boy but he never saw him again. He must have been worth knowing, that father. Did they ever learn the boy's name? No, the little girl's father would not let anybody try. Said he was probably the descendant of some proud old cotton king down south, and would turn up some day, either very bad or very good. They always did. A reporter had taken a snapshot of him as he sat on the hospital cot but her father took his camera from him by force and gave him fifty dollars in place of it. The little girl has the picture yet. But if they had published the picture— Oh, you didn't know her father. He said it would be a violation of honor, as between gentlemen. No, he had begun life a friendless boy himself, and he understood. A beautifully told story. Tell me of the little girl who was saved. There is the romance. The boy promised to come back when he became famous. Ah! But he has probably forgotten her in his own struggles. She was nothing to him after all, only a little girl child he had pulled out of the water. But she, well, as the years passed, he grew to be almost a god in her memory. You see, there were the old papers to read over, and the little picture and the song he had given her, and there was the telling of it all, over and over, at school. Her romance became a living thing, an immortal thing. I know, a thought conceived is a living thing, expressed it is immortal. Then her mother died, and they built that beautiful window in memory of her, and then her father. Now she is her own mistress, though an uncle imagines he is, in fact, as well as in law, her guardian. She comes nearer being his. They call her a terror at home. Still, men have wanted to marry her, many of them, but she is unchanging in her faith that some day her hero will come back and claim her. 
What do you suppose her father said to her? His very last words. Wait for him until you are twenty-one. It takes a long time for a boy to become famous. I think I know him. He will come if he makes good, and when he does come, remember, it's fifty-fifty. She had never told her father of her dream, but he had guessed, and he smiled when he saw he had guessed right, and died with the smile on his face. So she waits, and waits, and waits, at times most unhappy. Do you suppose he will come back, King? How could he? How could such a boy come to claim so rich a girl? He answered earnestly. It seems to me she would know that the boy was father to the man. Her wealth will always be between them. Besides, he may have proved a dismal failure. What? He? Billy looked up indignant. Why, he just couldn't fail. Do you really think he is bound to come back to her when he succeeds? Certainly. Don't you? I do not. Has she ever seen him again? She thinks she has, once, but he did not know it. She is afraid if she sought him, she would lose him. Ah, she understands him, after all, then. But she doesn't want just him. She wants him to make good. Wants him the same independent boy she remembers. She knows, too, that only in stories do New York heiresses marry poor unknown young men. Money isn't everything with them, though. There is something better, but they don't all find it. A good name means a great name in New York, and a great name is better than riches with the rich city girl who is free to choose her husband. What a girl! What a tragedy should he have learned to love another! But he can't, King. He may not know it, but he can't escape a love like that. It will pull him from the end of the world. She is just outside his life, and her radiance is across his path. Some day she will just step in, and he will recognize her. You believe in that? You said so. Love isn't just an emotion, it's a power. Even God wouldn't try to tear it to pieces. He made it, and, well, I guess he knows there wouldn't be any immortality without it. King patted Billy's shoulder. Loyal to your ideals, aren't you? Good. When our ideals perish, the kernel's out of the shell, and juice out of the grape. And such, then, is the story of the little girl whose face is in the window. Yes, but wasn't it a miracle that Mr. Church, a very ordinary man, I am told, should have dreamed just such a dream, and have guessed those little faces into it? Mr. Church did not dream it, said King very gently. The girl's wondering eyes turned slowly toward him. What? Who, then? The design was furnished by Beaker, Toomer, and Church, but it was not Church's work. Whose, then? And as he hesitated, she repeated the question earnestly, Whose? And waited breathlessly. King hesitated and stirred uneasily. Mine, he said at length. Billy sat in strained silence. The information was for the moment beyond her comprehension. Her voice was a whisper when she spoke. You mean it is your work? You designed that window? Yes, I am a draftsman with Beaker, Toomer, and Church, as you know. Did I never mention that Art Glass Designs is my specialty there? Yes, it is my work. The little faces are half memory, half dream. One prays, one sleeps. Yours, yours, her hand tightened in the hand that again clasped it and shook. You, you furnished the memorial for my, my little girl's mother, for Agnes Vandeliever? Then you were the boy the little girl loved. You've been carrying the face that was lifted above you that night, the face that slept on your breast, in your heart, all these years. O oh, King, King, it's true, it's true, isn't it? She was trembling. Her hands tightened on his, and her eyes were beseeching him. Yes, he answered at length, I was that boy. The little faces have been with me all these years. 
I rather think they may have kept me out of bad company sometimes, and from loneliness. A sob shook Billy, and suddenly she slipped forward to her knees and buried her face in her arm on the pew rail. Presently King reached out and laid his hand on her shoulder. "'It doesn't change anything, Billy. There's but one girl in the world for me, one grown-up girl. I am sorry for Miss Vandilever's romance, but some day she will meet and marry a real man. They always do, these story girls. My little dream girls wouldn't know her now, nor she them. It is you who are the older vision of them, not the painted society, Belle. <laughs> "'Thank you, King,' she sobbed. Th "'That is good of you.' And then, with a wistful little smile, "'Oh, King, you must succeed. Do something great. Don't let another man steal your talents, your fame, and your sweetheart.'" Chapter Six. In the months that followed the meeting in the church, King saw Billy frequently. She came to him at places below Twenty-third Street, usually, and he could not help but notice that she was at times a little nervous. She developed a fancy for downtown picture shows, and he began to be concerned for her. Her dress was not always what it should have been, her gloves alternated between holes and darns. Once, admitting that she was hungry, she had let him take her into one of the white restaurants scattered throughout the city and served by girls. She enjoyed it all unaffectedly, the only drawback being that her beauty made her conspicuous. Their presence in the lunch-house raised a little storm of excitement among the girls, which King noticed with uneasiness. He arrived at the conclusion, unwillingly, that he was dressed too well for the girl he was escorting. And once, face to face with her, a gentleman paused and half raised his hat. He blocked the way. Billy's little chin went into the air, ignoring him, but King roughly shoved the fellow into the gutter. "'Shall I go back and beat him up?' he asked, overtaking Billy, who was hurrying away. "'No,' she said, a little hysterically and laughing. "'Come, he probably took me for someone else.' But King thought otherwise. One evening they wandered from a picture play and found a seat in Washington Square. "'See here, Billy,' he said. I don't know what your secret is, but we have about reached the limit in some things. I am going to be blunt, even rude, you will think. But last week you borrowed a car fare of me, and your gloves are frightful. And your dress! Come, it's all wrong. You won't marry me, won't talk about it even. Let's switch off, and you be just a trusting little friend in all things until your affairs straighten out. You need things. The fact keeps me unhappy. I have plenty of money. Let me be banker and provide everything. And if your job isn't pleasant or profitable, drop it. There is no need for you to do menial work or to be at the beck and call of exacting old ladies. I can take care of you until you find a congenial occupation. But her face was something more than a study when he looked into it after the offer, which had embarrassed him not a little. Her mouth trembled, and her eyes turned from him. "'You mean you want to want me to take a flat somewhere and, and let you p pay the rent?' "'Good God, no!' She watched him as though fascinated by a vision. "'King, it, it would be wonderful just to see you coming and going every day.' "'Billy!' she laughed and suddenly hid her face what a boy it is still she looked up shyly no king when you are your own man and successful and other men speak your name with admiration and you are so secure in your field you can marry whom you please even a girl who has done menial work if you want me then i will come to you and the flat if you want a flat till then it's just sweethearts "'Wait, then, until my office building is up,' he said, trying to disguise by affected gaiety how he was touched. Art glass was only my struggle for a foothold. I am, by education, an architect. "'Your office building? Who is it for?' "'John Throckmorton. But he doesn't know it yet.' 
"'John Throckmorton, the banker?' Billy gurgled and gasped. Then she suppressed a little scream and stared wildly. "'Yes, the plans are all ready.' "'Has he seen them?' "'No, there's the hitch. He has only talked about a thirty-five-story building out in Chicago, a trust fund investment. So far it has been impossible to break through the guard around him. Harvard couldn't do it.' She was silent a long moment, with parted lips still staring at him. "'Listen, King, do you believe in premonitions?' "'Hunches? Yes. Terence, my office boy, has one every time there is a big game on up in the park, and he needs somebody to finance him. They never fail.' "'I have one now. Try again. For my sake, won't you?' For your sake, I'll camp on Throckmorton's trail like a poor relation. What time has your premonition selected? Tomorrow, at twelve o'clock. Sounds more like lunch than hunch. Send your card in at twelve, will you? I'll gamble on you once, Billy. At twelve, my card goes in, for your sake. At twelve one, I come out for my own, he laughed. You promise? King, I am really very superstitious. So am I, about you. At twelve o'clock next day, King handed his card to the red-headed outer guard at Banker Throckmorton's office. To his everlasting astonishment, the boy smiled genially. Come in, Mr. Doomingen, he said, and by the inner guard, and the extreme inner guard, and the secretary entanglements, King marched straight into the august presence. All roads led to Rome. Ten minutes later he came out, his head in the clouds. His cherished plans for a thirty-five-story office building were behind him. Billy's eyes danced when he told her the story. But he went no more. The banker had promised to send for him when he got a report on the plans from older architects. He did not send and Billy was away in Boston with that restless old woman. What the devil did she want to be prancing around the country for at her age? Meaning the old woman, of course. Hope began to shrivel. The office building grew smaller. It lost a story a day for thirty-five days. Nothing but the cellar, a hole in the ground, was left. He laid himself down in that and pulled the hole in and the green grass grew all around. Then Billy came back with a rush, and things began to move. Fate had completed her gambit. She pushed a queen. The queen was Billy, of course. A wonderful day was at hand for King. End of chapters 5 and 6